Uh, just to introduce myself again, uh, my name is Rob. I'm a technical account manager here at AdaCore. Um, AdaCore is a company that uh, does software design uh, language tools uh, for safety critical applications. Uh, these are applications where uh, if there's any failure in the software, uh, it's catastrophic. So we've been doing this for over 25 years now, and we've been supporting industries which are typically a bit considered safety critical. So if you think aerospace, railway, things like that, these are your traditional safety critical markets. If you look at the automotive market, there hasn't really been an introduction of software into the automotive market until fairly recently, and it wasn't really considered safety critical until very recently. And now that we're suddenly talking about software that can actually control your car, we're suddenly seeing the same issues that you'd see in aerospace in the automotive market. So in today's presentation, we're going to talk about how you can write ASIL4 software and how you can verify that that software is safe to be deployed in your systems. And we're going to talk about these two languages, Spark and Ada. Actually, Spark is a subset of Ada. It's really only one language. And we're going to compare that to the C language. We've seen that most automotive applications and a lot of embedded applications in general use the C language just because that's traditionally what's used. Uh, there's a lot of tooling available. Uh, C is what's the basis of most operating systems. The most developers know C. So uh, we're going to look at that and then compare Spark and Ada to, the, to, to C. So to get started, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, again, Ada and Spark. And just so I can show you just some simple examples of how the language compares to C and how you might get some benefit from that. And then we're going to talk about how you could use those languages to actually verify or actually formally prove certain properties of your system. And then we're going to talk about how that applies to the ISO 26262 standard. Uh, we know that in the automotive market, that's sort of the standard that most people are shooting for. So we'll actually talk about what tools are available for ISO 26262. So to get started, let's talk a little bit about Ada and Spark. Um, the Ada language uh, was designed originally as a safety critical language. Uh, let's compare that to C. C was originally developed as a prototyping language. Uh, the idea for C, and that it's still, if you read the, the, the core principles of the C language, and uh, C was designed to move fast and allow the developer to do anything they needed to do. However, that requires that all the responsibility for generating correct code is put on the developer. The compiler doesn't take any of that responsibility. Now, compared to Ada and Spark, Ada was originally designed to take a lot of that responsibility off the developer and into the compiler. And let's see an example of why that might be interesting. So let's look at this little piece of C specification here. We can see that we're creating a type alias here where this type temperature is a float. And then we have this procedure update. That procedure takes a parameter, which is a pointer to some variable of type temperature called T. Now, if we look at this and we, without any comments, and we know that in most C code, we're going to be staring at all the comments around the specification here. But let's look at this in a vacuum without the comments. What do we know about this type temperature? All we know is a float. We have no idea what the designer intended for the ranges that go in this type. We don't know if temperature should be a minimum of 10 or a minimum of 3 million. We don't know if the mat what the maximum is. We don't know in this subprogram if this T, this temp the pointer to a temperature T, is an input. We don't know if it's an output. So we don't know if it should be initialized. We before we call this subprogram, 
We don't know if we're implementing the subprogram, if there's already a value in uh, uh, the location that T is pointing to. We don't know if this, uh, this uh, subprogram modifies T. Uh, we don't know if this uh, pointer to T is an array. We have no idea. And again, typically this is taken care of uh, with the comments that the developer would put in. Interestingly though, if code is refactored and the comments aren't updated, there's a disconnect. And this is something that traditionally happens and this should be caught during peer review. Let's look at the similar type of code in Ada to kind of get an idea of how we could actually make this slightly more interesting. So let's say this is, we're doing the same thing here where we have a type, which we're calling temperature. We're specifying that it's a floating point type with at least 17 digits of precision. We're specifying that it has a range between negative 273.15 to 1000. Uh, so now what we did here is this would normally be done in comments, but in Ada, we've actually put this into the specification. So now the compiler can check to make sure we have consistency. So let's say in this procedure update, we have T, which is a type temperature. We now know that this subprogram uh, is using an updating temperature. So we should expect that T already has a value when update is called, and we should expect that it is modified by this procedure update, or it could potentially be modified by this procedure update. So what's interesting here is let's say we have a variable of type temperature, and we try to store a value of 1001.6 in that, in that uh, variable you can see that that would violate the range that we've specified here. What would happen in Ada is that when this gets compiled, the compiler is gonna insert a runtime check before any time we modify a variable of type temperature. That runtime check is going to verify that the value that's being stored into the variable of type temperature does not violate this range. Now in C, that would have to be manually written. In Ada, this is done by the compiler. And if we think about that sort of check, that sort of check is very trivial. And there's going to be a lot of them. The potential for a developer to forget to do those checks in C is very high. Traditionally, we'd probably do something with macros in C to verify certain things like this. But again, now we're using macros. We have to have all these extra uh, procedure calls. Whereas in Ada, the compiler just does an expansion, adds in these checks, and we're good to go. Now, interestingly, with those checks, the compiler inserts these checks, and those checks can be checked at runtime. However, with static analysis tools, we can actually verify statically that no value that violates this range could be stored in a variable of type temperature. And we'll see that shortly when we start talking about the Spark subset of Ada. So what we're seeing here is that the Ada language was designed to be a little bit more syntactically rich. We can see there's a lot more words here than what we saw in the, in the C specification. However, for a developer, and especially for software that needs to be maintained for a long period of time, and software that needs to be audited, software that needs to have static analysis tools run on it, this extra syntax that we've added here becomes very important. It becomes much more readable and much more maintainable. Another interesting thing that you'll see a lot in the C language is compiler guessing. So here's an example of some uh, type conversions that'll happen in, in an expression. So we can see that uh, A and C are integers and B is a float. If we were to do this 
in C language, A divided by B stored in an in integer C. Do we all know what's going to happen? All of us who are C developers uh, probably know all the rules for what the compiler is going to do in this case. But let's say I'm a not a C expert. Do is A going to get converted to a float and the division happens in float space and then the expression gets converted back to an integer? Or is B going to get converted to an integer and then the division happens in integer space and then that gets stored into the integer? In ADA, this actually can't happen. You can't do this. The compiler will actually throw an error here because this is an implicit type conversion. Uh, the this in type of implicit type conversion uh, is can potentially cause issues because we don't know if this division is going to happen in float space or if it's going to happen in integer space. And as you can see, uh, these two arrows pointing down here are the two potentials that you would have to do to get this to compile correctly. We either have to explicitly convert B to an integer and then do the division. So all of the expression happens in uh, in integer space, or we'd have to explicitly convert A to a float, do the division, and then convert the, the resulting uh, that expression back into an integer. So you can either pick one of these two things, but based on your specification, you'll know which one to pick instead of the compiler picking for you. So this avoids a problem where you assume the compiler is going to do one thing and it actually does the other. So uh, I, I'm going to address one question here. Uh, so I, uh, I'll address some of the questions during the during the presentation, and some of them I can do after. Uh, so one of the questions is, why do we need a new further programming language? Um, this is a good question. Um, the Ada language has been around for a long time. Uh, it's actually been around since uh, 1983. Uh, it was originally incepted in 1979. It's actually a few years younger than the C language, surprisingly. Um, and it's been used very heavily in uh, aerospace and railway. So this isn't a new language by any means. Uh, you look at other languages uh, in, the, in the space, and those are new, non-mature languages. This is a very mature languages, language. There's actually been ADA 83, 95, 05, 2012, and then they're currently working on the, uh, the 2020, actually it's the 2202X version of the language. Uh, so the, the language has come a long way, and then we'll see shortly why the Spark subset becomes interesting. Going back to why we're going to favor explicit code. One, to avoid compiler guesses, but also two, to avoid issues where we're going to do things that could be potentially suspect. So if we look at the top here, the C, the C, C code here. We can see that i is a pointer to an integer. We're allocating the one uh, an integer and then storing the resulting pointer in i. And then we're promptly incrementing i. What is i pointing to now? Nothing. It's garbage. And if I were to read this, and let's say you have a bunch of expressions in between this i++ and the, the initialization of i, I would think this i++ is an array. I would think I was, was an array. I would have no idea that it's actually just an int. So again, there's not enough information here to understand what's happening. If we look at the equivalent ADA at the bottom here, you can see there's a lot of words, and there's a lot of words that will cause you to go, what's going on here? Specifically, when we look at this unchecked word right here. That's immediately telling you that there's something suspect going on here, and it should be reviewed. Now, what we're actually doing here, type i underscore acc is access all integer. What we're saying is that i underscore acc is now a pointer type. So basically, if in the next line here, we're doing the same thing we're doing on this first line in C. So i is a pointer to an integer, and we're going to create an integer. 
and actually store that integer in there with the new keyword, just like you would in C++. Now, these next two lines, we have these two functions. These are actually uh, implementations of a, the generic ada.unchecked conversion. What this does is it allows us to do conversions between types that aren't uh, necessarily compatible. So if we were to convert between a pointer type and an integer, uh, well, they're two different things. A pointer type is not an integer. Uh, and in C, that's actually true. A pointer type is not an integer. Uh, typically, it's a long, long or something like that. Depends on your operating system. So what this is doing is we're actually creating these two functions that will allow us to do these unsafe conversions. Now, we're seeing this word unchecked here. This is telling us something weird is going on here. And then this expression at the bottom with these explicit casts is allowing us to do the same thing we do in this I++. Again, if I'm reviewing this code and I see this at the top in C, I'm going to go, great, OK, I is an, I is an array. We're incrementing the, the, through the array. Great, this is no problem. If I see the bottom, I go, oh, wait a minute. I see unchecked here. Something's going on. I is no longer pointing to the original memory allocated. We've just lost the memory. Now we have a memory leak. So the ability for Ada to be more explicit allows reviewers to understand if something difficult or something that is not necessarily the simplest thing, it not, if there's something happening that could potentially be suspect, it's easier for the reviewer to catch that. Now, that's not to say you wouldn't do this sort of thing in Ada, because you definitely would. But again, it's something that your reviewer would say, let's look into this. Now, with this extra syntax that we have in Ada, uh, we have the ability to sort of take a lot of the stuff that would happen in comments and actually make it into uh, syntax of the language. So like for instance, if we have a procedure or a, a subprogram, a function in, in, in C, uh, by the way, a procedure in Ada is like a void function in, in, in C. So a procedure doesn't have any return type, uh, whereas a function in Ada would be like a, would, would return something. So we actually make a, a, an explicit, um, keyword difference between procedure and function in Ada, but it's basically in C, it's void or some whatever the return type is. So this, we have this procedure sort. It's going to take a variable A of type an array. We know that it's an in out, which means that we expect values to already be in A, and we're going to modify A in this procedure. By the way, this in out, this mode, parameter mode here, you can't do that in C. Uh, the potential in Ada is in, in, out, or out. Um, interestingly, if you have an out parameter or an in, out parameter, this is like the equivalent of passing things back to the caller via pointer. But in C, if you do that, you have no idea if that pointer is an in, an out, or an in, out. Whereas in Ada, it's very explicit. You'll also notice here that there's no pointers being used. So in order to pass an array into a function in C, you need to pass that via pointer. In Ada, arrays are first class citizens. You can actually pass the type. So that becomes very interesting. Uh, in most Ada and Spark applications, you actually do, don't need pointers at all. And we all know as C developers that pointers are, are a constant area where we have issues. We also, in the subprogram, we have these two variables from and to, which are integers. So we can kind of figure out that this procedure sort should be sorting this array uh, from index from to index to. You'll notice that the reason I can figure that out is I can actually see this with pre and some logic here. This is what's called a precondition. This is telling me that the caller of this procedure sort should guarantee this precondition. So before the caller calls sort, they should verify that the variable from is a valid index in the array A. 
So we can see a tick range here. Tick range is an attribute. So because arrays are first class citizens in ADA, we can actually get information from the array type or the, the variable. So if I call tick range, that's actually telling me what the first and last index are. So if I say from in a tick range, that's telling that's saying that this variable from needs to be a valid index in A. We can see that we have a logical and, and we do the same thing for this variable two. Two should be a valid index in A. We're also gonna guarantee that from is less than or equal to two. So that tells us that uh, this is, uh, we're calling proce this procedure sort with valid parameters. We can also see that there's a post condition here. That post condition says that the index from of variable of, of array A, you can see in, in, in uh, C, we use square brackets to index into a, a, um, in a uh, an array. In ADA, we use parentheses. Uh, we're guaranteeing that the value in the index from in array A is less than or equal to the value in index two of uh, array A. So this precondition says what the caller needs to guarantee before they call a procedure. And this post condition gives guarantees back to the caller to say, this is what the implementation, Im implementation will do. Now, again, this is stuff that would be put in comments in C. When we refactor this code, we have to make sure we, we change those comments. Uh, it's very possible that the comments can come out of sync with the actual specification. In ADA, this is actually part of the code now. So the compiler actually checks this consistency and will insert runtime checks. Uh, so these pre and post conditions will be inserted as runtime checks. And we'll see shortly how Spark uh, can use these in static analysis. So uh, another question here, um, someone's asking what sets ADA apart from Pascal? That's a really good question. So ADA was actually designed after Pascal. You'll notice the same syntax. Uh, the Pascal language uh, wasn't, doesn't have a lot of these safety features. Like for instance, these pre and post conditions we're looking at now, uh, Pascal doesn't have. Uh, this is very specific to the ADA, uh, ADA and Spark languages. This is actually ADA 2012 we're looking at right now. Um, and Spark, can use these uh, pre and post conditions as well. So think of ADA as uh, an evolution of the, of the Pascal language. Really, the only thing that they uh, share is the syntax. So why is all of this useful? Why is all the specification, all this extra wording useful? We've already seen that this makes the intent of the code more clear for implementers and users. So as I'm looking at specification, there's more information there for me to understand what's actually gonna happen, as opposed to needing to read through comments, which may or may not be there. So if I'm implementing code, I'm looking at the specification going, oh, I see this post condition and this precondition. I understand how I need to implement this subprogram. If I'm a user of this code, I'm looking at the API reference and saying, oh, this subprogram has a precondition. I know I can't call that. Uh, without guaranteeing uh, these uh, logical conditions. We've seen that the compiler can check lo local consistency at compile time. So let's say I try to take a, that type temperature and I try to store an initial value of 3000 in it. Well, we know that the max range was 1000. The compiler will reject the compilation and say, that's not possible, you can't do that. However, let's say that uh, we compute a value and store it into temperature. The compiler can insert the runtime check to make sure that there's consistency. And static analysis tools can actually demonstrate, can prove all of this consistency. And actually, let's look at that. So we've sort of looked at ADA. Now ADA is a general purpose programming language that allows you to do anything you can do in C. Uh, if we take ADA and we subset it slightly, 
such that we remove features of the language which will inherently cause undefined behavior. We, that allows us to do what we call formal proof, which is similar to what we would say sound static analysis. So what that means is that means that we can prove that we can find all potential errors that would happen in a code of a certain class of error. We'll actually see that in a moment. So Spark 2014, uh, the syntax of Spark 2014 is uh, the same as the syntax for any ADA 2012. This becomes interesting because now we have a formal proof language which shares the exact same language as the implemented uh, code. Now, if you were to compare this to something like Framacy in C, uh, Framacy requires you to put everything in comments. Those comments aren't actually checked by the compiler, so you can have inconsistencies suddenly. With Spark, it's the same syntax. So what you do in Spark is valid ADA. So you can write a bunch of code in Spark, prove a bunch of it, and then compile it with your, your ADA compiler. With the Spark toolset, you have kind of three design, three, three big principles. Number one is a design methodology. That design methodology is going to be how you think about taking your implementation or taking your, your, your specification, your design, and actually creating a specification from that. Number two is the language. So this is ADA 2012. And number three is the static analysis, which lets you verify the loop. So you have design, you create a specification, you write your implementation, and then you use formal provers to prove that your implementation follows from your specification. We can do things like we can guarantee correct data flow. We can guarantee absence of runtime errors. We can verify component interfaces. We can verify behaviors. We have a lot of power with the Spark language. And let's actually look at some examples. So let's say we have this array, my array. And we're going to index into that with this index index. And then um, we are going to store the result of this expression x times y divided by z. You'll notice here that we, in ADA, we use the uh, colon equals as a store, uh, as opposed, and, and then we use just a single equals as a test, as opposed to C where you have a single equals and a double equals. Uh, this is also an attempt to sort of make it more explicit what you're trying to do. Also, if you were to, uh, in ADA, you, the um, test equals is not an expression, so you can't, store the expression in a variable like you can in C. This becomes a problem in C because if you accidentally forget to write double equals uh, and you in an if statement, let's say, your if statement will still evaluate properly, whereas in ADA, that would be a, a, a compile error. So let's look at this, this little piece of code here. How much can you find here that could be a potential runtime error? So basically anything that would happen that would create erroneous execution. Well, index could be out of bounds of the array. X times Y could potentially overflow the integer type or whatever type these are. X times Y divided by Z could be out of range. So let's say these are all floats and Z is very small. Uh, that would be an overflow. Um, or let's say this, uh, the types inside my array are very small and x times y divided by z gives us a very big number. That could potentially be an issue. Uh, z could potentially be zero here. Uh, and something that we very rarely think about is everything initialized. Now, if I were writing this specification in C, I would have to explicitly check all this stuff or I'd have to prove from my design that these things can't happen. With the Spark Prover, I can actually just write this line of code and rely on the Spark Prover to handle all of these checks for me. 
this becomes interesting when we start talking about code bases that are hundreds of thousands or millions of lines of code. We have uh, ADA users that are working with code bases in the one to three million lines of code range. Uh, and they rely on these types of checks every day to make sure that uh, their code isn't going to uh, do something erroneous. And again, with the Spark Prover, we actually don't need those runtime checks. We can prove all of this statically. This becomes interesting because if we insert all these runtime checks, we're actually inserting code, which is going to limit the performance and limit the code size that we are. It's going to increase the code size and limit our performance. Uh, with Spark, if you prove that none of these runtime errors can happen, you can turn all those compiler generated checks off if you want. So now your code size gets smaller, gets faster, and you're guarantee, you, you guarantee statically that none of those checks could, uh, could fail. There's another interesting thing we can do uh, with these extra, this extra syntax. Here's a, a procedure that we're going to uh, loop over. We're going to loop over this array A uh, with an iterator. Uh, and what we need to check prior to doing this loop is to make sure that iterator is actually a valid index inside that array. So as you can see, before we hit the loop, we have this if statement. Now, this can potentially be a problem, especially if we let's say have the first line, which is the specification, and the second line, uh, and, and the, the implementation in two different files, which you do in, in Ada, just like you would in C. But let's say this is an API and you're, you're statically, you're linking to a uh, pre-built library. You won't get to see this implementation. You'll only see that procedure next uh, um, uh, specification here. So, if the designer of this API doesn't explicitly write, please don't call this with the iterator uh, outside of a, a tick range, then you'll never know that you can't do that. Well, what happens if we do this, where we actually upgrade that defensive check to a precondition? What we've done here is we've actually put the responsibility of this check on the caller. So instead of having the responsibility in this implementation, we've actually said the caller must guarantee this. So we've actually upgraded this defensive check to the caller. And that defensive check, we can actually upgrade multiple times. So if you have an entire call tree and you have a bunch of preconditions, there is some point in that call tree where it makes sense to do all these logical checks and handle all of the potential issues. Whereas if you're in this procedure next, does it really make sense to handle uh, the, the, an issue if iterator is not in the range? Like, why would you want to do that handling in this procedure next? You probably want to handle that somewhere where you're computing the value iterator. So we've effectively replaced defensive code, which, ex which exists in the implementation, with a contract or a precondition which now exists in the specification. So this becomes documentation and potential runtime check and the ability uh, and a, uh, something that static analysis can use to make sure the caller doesn't violate this. Now, uh, we can get much more complicated with these sorts of contracts. So in this case, we have this procedure find and it has uh, this array, uh, my, uh, this my array type A. We have a value v, we have a start, an integer start. Uh, and um, we can see here that a uh, precondition is start is in a tick range. And we can see this post condition actually has if else log, if, if, if then else logic, and actually has a for loop in it. So we're actually checking consistency of an array and doing logic inside this contract. So, this allows us to make sure that, let's say I write the specification, uh, but I don't write the implementation. And I have another engineer that's going to be doing the implementation. I'm going to write this specification based on the design. Another engineer is going to write the implementation. And then we can use the Spark Prover to prove consistency. 
So this becomes very interesting now because we can actually split responsibilities and then prove that uh, everything matches. So what makes Spark valuable? Uh, it's usable by software engineers. So the people writing the implementation, uh, people writing the specification uh, can use the same language. Uh, the specifications can be debugged. Uh, so you can actually write uh, assertions right in the code and the Spark Proofers can actually take those assertions into account to try and figure out where a potential issue might be uh, existing. And uh, properties that are hard to prove otherwise through like traditional testing, you can actually write those, comp those complex contracts like I showed you earlier uh, and then prove all of those statically. The guarantees you have on program properties here since we're formally proving, meaning we're using sound static analysis, it provides very strong guarantees that what you have implemented matches what, you, uh, what your specification. And in some cases, you can actually replace tests. So if you formally prove a piece of code, uh, it's very possible that you could replace all of your testing uh, with that formal proof. And actually, we'll see in a moment that uh, ISO 26262 does allow you to do that. You wouldn't want to necessarily replace, let's say, your integration testing or your application level testing, but you could get rid of a lot of your unit tests. So ISO 26262, and I apologize, I'm speeding up. Uh, we are, I am running a little low on time. So uh, let's consider uh, Ada and Spark in ISO 26262. As with every certification standard, ISO 26262 talks a lot about uh, design to specification to implementation uh, and that how that happens. So you're talking a lot about um, how your specification was defined, how your implementation was defined, and then you want some ability to verify that your implementation matches your specification. So with Spark, you can do all of that. You write your specification based on your design, you write all of your contracts, you implement your code, and then you do use the Spark provers to prove that feedback loop. And again, this all happens in the same language. This becomes very interesting because typically this is done in testing. So you'd have to actually write a bunch of tests and then run your code through those tests, find your issues, go back to development, uh, fix your problems, go back to tests, uh, run the tests again, go back to development. So you have this iteration where you have to keep going back and forth between development and testing. Now, if development and tests are the same people, that becomes easy. But in a lot of cases, especially large programs, they are two different, two different groups. So what you're gonna to wanna to do here is potentially reduce that iteration cycle. So with Spark, you can actually reduce the amount of time that it takes to do this because the person who's implementing it can just run the Spark Prover. Now, because you have this limb, the, the less of a iteration here and because the compiler is taking a lot of the responsibility to generate correct code, there is a, a large potential for, for savings here in terms of how much money you spend on your project. On the left here, we can see C and C++, the developer is responsible for inserting a lot of the checks that we saw earlier. Whereas with Ada and Spark, a lot of that is done automatically. This allows your developers to focus on the application that they're developing, rather than thinking about exactly what's gonna happen with each line of code and whether or not this is safe in the language they're using. The compiler handles a lot of that for you, and that can be proved with static analysis. The chart on the right here is uh, from a study that was done by a uh, consultant group called VDC Research. Uh, they looked at uh, a bunch of projects in the aerospace domain uh, and the co cost of uh, various programming languages versus C. And you can see in this case uh, that Ada uh, had a lot of potential cost savings. And most of that had to do with the fact that the iteration cycle between development and testing was much shorter. In a lot of cases, uh, in a lot of tests completed the first time because the implementation was correct or proven correct uh, by provers and other static analysis tools. Now let's look at the how you can actually use Spark in uh, in ISO 26262. So this is one of the tables uh, from ISO 26262. Uh, we can see on the left that uh, a bunch of the rules uh, of uh, design principles 
and then how uh, Spark actually addresses those. So like for instance, uh, initialization of variables here, uh, Spark can actually prove that all variables you use are initialized before you use them. Uh, in C, uh, this is very difficult to prove. I, I, with MISRA provers, you can kind of prove this. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, you can't actually soundly prove that, where with uh, Spark, you can guarantee that any use of a variable, whether it be local or global, is initialized before you use it. That makes sure you're not using anything garbage in that variable. Uh, you can avoid global variables or justify their usage. There, uh, there is syntax within Spark to enforce uh, what globals are used or not used in various applications. Uh, there is a keyword um, called global where it actually allows you to specify uh, a bunch of um, logic about what globals are allowed and what aren't. We already talked about the limited use of pointers here, where in uh, Ada and Spark, it's very rare that you actually need pointers. Uh, so this is very opposed to how this works in C, where most of your types are first-class citizens and you don't actually need these pointers. Uh, you can see here that in Ada and Spark, the compiler doesn't allow you to, to do implicit type conversions. So this is all taken care of by the language. Now, uh, let's talk, talk about tools. Uh, we can see that there, is, are, so, there are a lot of benefits to Ada and Spark in uh, safety critical and ISO 26262 applications. Uh, the, uh, however, but the important part here is that there are tools available for you to use. So uh, the Ada Core GNAP Pro Ada tool suite, which is the uh, main development tool suite, uh, with it, which includes full IDEs and full development tools, compilers, tool chains, debuggers, testing tools, um, basic static analysis tools, everything like that, is qualified to TCL3 with ISO 26262. There's this other tool called CCG, which is allows you to use Ada and Spark in uh, on processors that don't have uh, traditionally have a an Ada compiler, um, so this is uh, things where like you're using a custom DSP or something like that. You can actually use Ada and Spark and actually get all the benefits from all those tools. Generate C code and then use the C compiler that is provided by that let's say that DSP vendor to actually put that code on your uh, on your processor. So you can get all the benefits of Ada and Spark without actually needing a dedicated um, Ada and Spark compiler. That's also qualified to TCL3. And then uh, there are Spark, the Spark verification tools we already talked about are TCL3 as well. And that actually does allow you to uh, replace uh, certain um, tests with these formal proofs. So because we're running out of time here, I'm gonna switch to just one or two questions that we have here. Uh, one of the questions that we have is, uh, let's say uh, I already have application code uh, in C, what's the strategy to introduce Ada and Spark? That's a great question. Um, Ada and Spark is not an all or nothing solution. Uh, you can actually, because Spark is valid Ada and Ada is interoperable with C and C++, you can actually have all of those in the same application. So. Uh, Ada cores, Ada compilers are based on GCC backend. So you can write uh, Ada, Spark, and so you can write your safety critical section in Spark, write a bunch of other things in Ada, and then keep your current C stuff, let's say, and then uh, compile them and link them all together. So this allows you to transition very small por por portions of your code, little piece at a time. This is a great strategy to kind of go, okay, well, I have this one little problematic piece of code here. Let's do a little bit of Spark just to see if this works, compile it all together, do all your testing, and then you can even deploy that and then say, okay, let's move on to the next piece of code that could potentially be problematic. Uh, next question here, what is the best way to learn Ada and Spark? So there is a, uh, a website we have available called learn.adacore.com. Uh, on that website, it's an interactive website where you actually have editors right in the browser. So you can actually write code right in the browser. There are intro to Ada and intro to Spark courses available there. You can actually prove code right in the browser as well. So I would highly recommend checking that out just to see what the language is like and how it could be useful for you. So it looks like we're out of time. So thank you all for your time and I'll turn it back over uh, uh, to you guys now. <laughs>